Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 230,000 cases of breast cancer are diagnosed in women each year in the United States. And sadly, more than 40,000 women die each year from the disease. Statistics show that one in eight women will be affected by breast cancer in their lifetime, and the risk goes up as you get older. The good news is early detection and innovative treatments are helping more women survive longer with a breast cancer diagnosis. We're talking about this, of course, because October, if you haven't noticed, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And here to discuss is the outgoing director of the Breast Diagnostic Clinic at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Karthik Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is transitioning to her new role as Division Chair of General Internal Medicine. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, Do- Tom and Tracy. Do- Appreciate it. Dr. Ghosh, good to see you, and congratulations on your new position. You know, it seems like every week, almost every week, we hear about a friend or a relative with a new diagnosis of breast cancer. Is breast cancer more common than it used to be? I believe that over time, the fact that women go in for screening mammograms, we are able to diagnose cancer earlier and earlier. That may be one of the factors uh, that affect the increasing numbers that we're seeing. Um, When we look at... um, incidents over time or uh, the numbers haven't really shown that much of an increase since about uh, early in when screening mammograms started there was an increase in incidence and after that it's kind of stabilized out Um, but uh, what we're also seeing is outcomes in terms of improved treatments and uh, we're hoping that that mortality reduction kind of will be seen over time. Is it partly because women are living longer, too? Well, absolutely, yes. Because, And you also know that age, as you mentioned, is a risk factor for breast cancer. So the longer women live, that is going to cause that increase to be more perceptible and then early, earlier diagnosis of breast cancer with mammography, uh, helping with uh, the diagnosis of very early types such as ductal carcinoma and site 2. I think it'd be fair to say that in addition to more and more women seemingly being uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, you also seem to have people who are having successful treatments, and I'm going to use really big finger quotes, an easier time of going through their cancer diagnosis and treatment, and I would suppose it's for the very same reason. Absolutely. In terms of uh, treatment of breast cancer, we have seen dramatic improvements thanks to the amazing work, the research work being done by breast cancer research specialists uh, at Mayo and throughout the world, we have seen huge advances in treatment of breast cancer. And as a result, it is not just in terms of uh, treatment, in terms of longevity, but also treatment of symptom management and uh, care of uh, patients at the end of life and all of that. So that's kind of what we are seeing in terms of improved outcomes. Uh, Yes. Uh, Isn't the the fact that uh, women are told that they have a one in eight chance of getting breast cancer, isn't that a little bit misleading? Because that's only true if you live long enough, right? So if you're a 40-year-old woman, then your chances of getting breast cancer are what, one in... 50 or something like that. That's exactly right. You know, I think that as we live longer, because age is a risk factor, our, the likelihood of developing breast cancer increases as we get older. And so that's why when we talk about screening, you know, there's the whole controversy, and we will come to that in a little bit about, you know, do we do mammograms or not? Uh, younger women have less likelihood of developing breast cancer, but as we get older, the likelihood increases. So the longer you live, you hear more about uh, breast cancer diagnosis. And one of the things we also see is that as we live longer, one of the age-dependent kind of cancers are the, the slower-growing kind of cancers, more treatable with good outcomes. So, I wanna, Before we talk about the different tests and mammography and the current guidelines, I want to ask you about breast self-exams because it seems like uh, we were told, women were told at one time that every month they ought to check their breasts and when they're in the shower or the tub. And then a few years ago, the word came out that really uh, women shouldn't even try to examine their own breasts because it isn't helpful. Where, where do you stand? The whole uh, recommendation, the United States Preventive Services Task Force did come out with the recommendation that breast self-exams are not necessary, clinical breast exams are not necessary. And some of this is based on research that was conducted in Shanghai, China, where they kind of looked at women who had had regular breast exams and another group that hadn't, and they found that maybe there wasn't much of a difference. However, 
we do know that there are women who come in who have self-detected cancers uh, that were not picked up even on a screening mammogram that was done in the recent past. Right. Um, self-awareness is what we call it now, is being familiar with your breast. That if you notice a change in your breast, so in a shower when you're soaping yourself and you've felt something, get it checked out. So self-awareness is something that is very important, and we do encourage our women to, to be self-aware. And it's not just about women. It's about every individual being familiar about their bodies. If something changes, go seek help. And really, therefore, we strongly do encourage breast self-awareness. All right. Um, let's talk about the current guidelines for mammograms because there's some controversy there, too. So the screening mammogram uh, recommendations vary in fact, even by institutions or different groups. So the United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends that women start yearly screening mammography at age 50, and then you can do biennial, which is every other year. And that for women from 40 to 49, um, you discuss with your healthcare provider and then decide if you want to do the mammogram. And the American Cancer Society uh, came out with the recommendation start screening at age 45. Um, how a National Comprehensive Cancer Network says start screening at age 40. You know, at Mayo Clinic, we've kind of looked at all of these data, and we uh, believe in working together as an institution, one Mayo. We have a Breast Standards Council, which incorporates our, all our various uh, sites. And what we decided looking at the data was it would be reasonable to start screening at age 40 uh, with the recommendation, again, encourage, educate our patients. What are the benefits? What are the risks? The benefits of early detection um, uh, compared to the downsides, you know, the downside of mammography, of course, you go in, if you're called back for additional testing, there is anxiety related to that. There is a risk of false positives. There is also the risk of false negatives. So false positives is you go in, there's a finding, you do a biopsy, and it's benign. Well, that was a lot of anxiety for the patient. The other is a false negative, which is, you know, women with dense breasts, which is on mammogram, the tissues look very dense, can miss a cancer. So there is that limitation of false negatives. And then the whole controversy about overdiagnosis of breast cancer. Sure. Are we picking cancer so early that perhaps it's not going to cause harm in the lifetime of that woman? So these are all information patients need to be aware of before they make their decision. But I will say this is when we talk about this, this is for the average risk population, a woman who does not have a family history or any other risk factors. For women who are at a higher risk, so if you have a family history or you have a gene mutation like a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation or women who have received radiation to the chest, these are because of, say, Hodgkin's or uh, diseases in the past, they are women considered at elevated risk where the screening guidelines are very different. All right. What about women with dense breasts? And, and I know mammogram is, is still the gold standard, but it's not perfect, yes. particularly when it comes to women with dense breasts. So what other tests do you have available for women like that? Thank you for asking that. You know, we this has been um, an area that has required a lot of work. Uh, radiology has been doing a lot of research to try and say what are the new advances. Some of the tests that are called, uh, that are, the whole group is called supplemental screening. The question really is, does a woman benefit from supplemental screening in addition to mammography if her mammogram showed dense breasts? And supplemental screening, one of the first things is tomosynthesis. This is the 3D mammogram. Uh, where you do the two, the top-down, side-to-side views of the breast, but while you do that, you take several sections of imaging through the breast, so it gives us a little more detail. The biggest advantage of 3D mammography is a re decrease in recall rates, which means being called back. It's a very big difference. When I look at uh, mammogram and versus that tomosynthesis one, it's like I'm looking at two different patients. Uh, it results. It's amazing. It does. So even the patient can tell the difference. Absolutely. <laughs> if I can tell the difference, it's a big deal. That's All right. Wonderful. And what else? And so 3D is um, uh, now getting to be routine for women in general. Regular mammograms are now becoming 3D. The next m important uh, advancement is molecular breast imaging, and uh, initiated uh, the, by studies at Mayo Clinic, uh, colleagues Dr. Deborah Rhodes and Dr. Michael O'Connor, with radiology and nuclear physicists, kind of worked to create to bring this to our practice. And what it is is 
a tiny dose of radioisotope is given intravenously, and that outlines the breast tissues in terms of it's a functional image of the breast and basically highlights areas of high blood flow and therefore high uh, uptake of the radioactive uh, material and therefore can very clearly identify cancers in women with dense breasts. And, you know, we generally say when you screen a 1,000 women with mammography, you pick up about four cancers. When you add tomosynthesis, it adds another one to three cancers per thousand women. With molecular breast imaging, it adds about another eight to nine cancers per thousand women. So that's definitely something that uh, to be considered for women with dense breasts. And then the next test is, molec is um, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI of the breast. MRI can pick up a lot more, so about 13 to 14 cancers per thousand women, but it's a being highly sensitive, the big concern is that it causes a whole lot of false positives and also the cost of the test. And so MRI of the breast is a supplemental screening for women at very high risk. And we have very clear guidelines on who should be pursuing MRI in addition to mammogram. All right, so if you have dense breasts, the alternatives to mammogram are tomosynthesis, MBI, molecular breast imaging, and MRI. All right, we've been talking about breast cancer screening and early detection with an expert, Dr. Karthik Ghosh, the outgoing director of the Breast Diagnostic Clinic at Mayo Clinic. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about risk factors plus different types of breast cancer and genetic testing. Who should get it? Also, plus, a myth or matter of fact, being overweight increases your risk of developing breast cancer. We'll find out. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and our guest is a Mayo Clinic expert on breast cancer, Dr. Kartha Ghosh. All right, myth or matter of fact, Dr. Ghosh, being overweight increases your risk of developing breast cancer. Is that a myth or a fact? That is indeed a fact. Uh, weight is one of our breast cancer risk factors, and so the more we can do to keep our weight down, the better it is. So cutting down... And the f actual management of that is eating healthy with regular and regular exercise. When we say eating healthy, it's actually cutting down on fat intake uh, would definitely be uh, a risk factor reduction and regular exercise. Um, the other things that will help uh, is uh, watching the alcohol intake um, because excess alcohol intake is a risk factor for breast cancer also. So we have uh, obesity, family history, obviously age. As you yeah. get older, you're more likely to get breast cancer. Alcohol, sedentary lifestyle. Did I miss anything? Sounds about right. Huh. Sounds Did like what a lot of our expert guests tell us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That yeah, the risk to, factors yeah. for a lot of things yes, are the same, exactly. aren't they? All right, let's talk about the different types of breast cancer because I know there are several different ones. Can you outline that for us? Sure. The breast cancer um, markers kind of help us identify what kind of cancers these are. So um, we have what is based on the location of the abnormality. We can call it breast cancer can be ductal or lobular cancers. Uh, but in general, what we're finding is that the biology matters and that tumors that are estrogen receptor positive, estrogen or progesterone receptor positive or HER2 positive or negative for each of these markers kind of identifies what type of tumor this is. So an estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 negative uh, breast cancer differs from a HER2 positive breast cancer and is different also from what is called a triple negative breast cancer. And the treatment for those is different, is Absolutely. what you're saying. That's why it's important. That's exactly right, because now biology is what drives cancer treatment. So it's very individualized to the type of cancer the person has. So if a woman has an estrogen-positive cancer, there are medications that go after the estrogen receptor. If the patient has a HER2-positive breast cancer, we have targeted therapy for the HER2-positive disease. What a... What a ways it has come. I mean, I'm not a breast cancer survivor, but I will meet women who are 30 or 40 year cancer survivors. And to look at what can be done for those patients today versus back then, it was back then there was like one treatment and that was it. Is that right? That is exactly right. I mean, initially it was women with breast cancer had the option of mastectomy, removal of all lymph nodes. And when chemo came into being, everybody got that chemotherapy. But now, thanks to, again, the breast cancer researchers um, who have really advanced 
to understand, number one, is that what is the biology of these cancers? And then based on the biology, try to find targeted treatments that work well. And so even conditions such as triple negative breast cancer, at one point, these were diseases which were hard to treat. And now we're coming up with newer therapies um, managed by our, our special oncologists who uh, come and create a treatment that is very specific for the patient. You know what I forgot? One of the risk factors? What? People have had prior radiation, which includes you because you had lymphoma when you were a kid. Very much so, yeah. That's why I get to go straight. I bypass all those <laughs> other things and go straight to the MRI, And which is interesting when you're talking about cancer treatment because they don't treat lymphoma that way anymore with radiation to the chest because... Now I'm at such an elevated risk. That's right. I mean, these kind of exposures, radiation therapy to the breast region does increase one's future risk of breast cancer. Usually we say about eight years out from the radiation, the woman should be year having yearly screening mammography and MRI. So come on, there Dr. Shives. What, do you, think, what huh. do you think I keep doing this program for so I can have <laughs> people like Dr. Ghosh on my side? <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Hurt. Thank you. And thank you for being the advocate for women. All right, genetic testing, confusing yes. subject. Uh, what tests are available and who ought to be genetically tested? So when we talk about women with a family history of breast cancer, um, you're always trying to understand, anybody who has a family history, we're trying to understand based on the family history, is there evidence to suggest that this family may be a family of carrying a gene, genetic abnormality that puts them at increased risk? What we used to know really was BRCA1 and BRCA2 were two genes associated with very high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, as information has evolved, as gene testing has become more available and knowledge has increased, we have found that there are other genes also that may be associated with breast cancer. So what does a woman do? Typically what we say is that if you have a family history, discuss with your physician let the clinician let them know that this is what my family history is and it's not only breast cancer if you have a family history of breast ovarian colon cancer males with prostate cancer melanoma um, and even pancreatic cancer these may all be linked and really any cancer seek help from your clinician so that then we can say, does this patient qualify to be sent for gene testing? Now, usually what we prefer is that when there is a family history like that, we say meet with a genetics counselor, seek the expert's opinion, and then they can guide you as to what is your likelihood of carrying a gene mutation, and that guides what kind of testing to be done. And depending on how you test, then you can give a woman advice about what she ought to do and how frequently she ought to be tested, et cetera. That's exactly right. There are very clear guidelines that a woman who carries a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation would benefit from MRI in addition to mammography. And the timing of initiating the treatment, generally we start MRI at age 25 for BRCA carriers, and then at age 30 we add mammography for these BRCA carriers. Then at some point when they've finished their childbearing earlier, that is in around 35 to 40 years, usually close to 40, we start talking about risk-reducing surgery. So again, uh, very important for these patients to be in touch with experts. All right, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the most important thing you want women to know? Be aware, be familiar with your breasts, seek medical attention if you notice any changes, and ask your doctor about going in for a mammogram. Be a, <laughs> an advocate for yourself. Just like Tracy. <laughs> Dr. Karthi Ghosh is a breast cancer expert at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Ghosh, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Tom and Tracy. It's been a privilege.